my name is Michael Rickards and this is the Hall Institute of Public Policies Forum. Today I'm delighted to have the opportunity to talk to Dr. Allison Lozana, who is the Executive Director of the New Jersey Council on Developmental Disabilities. You've had a long and distinguished career, Allison, and I see you've been as far flung as Utah and Tennessee. I have. Are you working in in that topic there too? Yes. Um, in fact, I've been working with people with developmental disabilities for about 37 years. How did you get interested in that? Well, straight out of undergraduate school, I needed a job. And uh, the Fort Worth State School in uh, Fort Worth, Texas, was just opening up and uh, they needed an intake worker. And so I was em employed, um, not realizing that it was going to be my life's work. Um, but that was almost 40 years ago now. Noble life's work? Yes. Take, give me some idea, really, of what's happening. Those of us that really are outside of the disability advocacy communities see a lot of disagreements going on with the question of institutionalization, deinstitutionalization, the role of the state government in it, the governor's preferences. Mm. Tell, tell me what's at stake here and uh, what your position is. Well, um, I have been in the field long enough to see the changes happen. And since about the 1970s, there has been a very strong movement uh, towards moving people out of the institutional model and into the community. And it has really uh, taken off in many states, not so much in New Jersey yet, um, but it's all based around the values that everybody belongs in the community and everybody needs to have the opportunity to live in, in the least restrictive setting. So what we are wanting to do is to offer that opportunity to live in the community to as, as many people as, as certainly can be placed and for whom it is appropriate. We are very pleased uh, that uh, Governor Christie uh, announced in his last, uh, no, the budget uh, for 2012 that uh, he wanted to close one of New Jersey's seven developmental centers. And uh, at the moment, we are waiting to see the outcome of the panel who's dis that is discussing that. But we feel that this is a good start in the right direction towards moving uh, people into a less restrictive setting and into settings where they can certainly become part of their community. But isn't the consequence of moving people out of, of state institutions where there's an infrastructure and throwing them into the community, isn't that a real problem in terms of the long-term solutions of, uh, there, of these people living among mm -hmm. us? There is infrastructure in the community. There are agencies that serve people very, very successfully in the community. And it's um, a matter of um, those agencies that are doing a very good job um, increasing their capacity. And this is what we're doing at the moment. And there's a great effort um, abroad in New Jersey to, to make that a reality, to make sure that the infrastructure is put in place so that there are adequate, safe uh, settings in the community for people to live. Don't the politicians support that because it means in the long run they can cut state aid to disabled? Well, um, this for us, this is not a financial issue. This is a moral issue. Um, and as, a, as I said, we believe that everybody belongs in the least restrictive setting, which is in the community. But there is a financial component to it. Um, and we do know that uh, it does cost less for a person to live in the community than to live in an institutional setting. However, that is not our primary goal in moving people out, is not to save people money. Uh, that's just a kind of a byproduct of, of what we feel is a, a really good uh, decision for people. In the early 60s, President Kennedy and his administration decided they were going to move towards deinstitutionalization of mental hospitals. Mm. putting the people, quote, back in the community. The result was a disaster right. in terms of the increase of the number of people who ended up homeless. Mm. Many of them have mental and still do have mental problems. Why won't that happen in this case also? 
I think uh, the issues surrounding a person with developmental disability are very, very different than people with mental illness. For the most part, people with developmental disabilities need long-term supports. And this has been um, part of the problem with moving people out, is that those, those supports have not been in place. But I think in the developmental disability community, we're very careful to make sure that those supports are in place before we move them. And I think that's what all of the work that's going on at the moment in the state and in other states around the country is to make sure that those um, mistakes, I guess we could call them, uh, that occurred as a result of, of, of downsizing of facilities for people with mental illness, that those mistakes are not made with people with developmental disabilities. In all of this, what's the role of the family? The family is very important, um, and, and I'm a family member, and I see my role as very important with, uh, with my child that I raised with a developmental disability. Um, I think we need to listen to the families and I know that there are some families that are very concerned um, about uh, institutional closure. And I think we need to be very um, aware of those fears and we need to address those fears. So I think we need to, to, to pay attention to what they're saying, and not, but not uh, lose sight of the fact that, that as a community we feel that um, people with developmental disabilities belong in the community. Where do we go from here then if we make this transition? I think um, we are starting slowly in New Jersey. There is talk of closing one institution. Which one is that? Um, well, the one that has been cited for closure is Vineland, which is in southern New Jersey. Right. Right. Um, I think when we get the results uh, from the panel uh, in August that is studying the issue, uh, the governor's panel, we will see whether, uh, whether they're going to close uh, Vineland or whether they're going to close another, maybe one, maybe more, maybe none. We'll have to wait and see what that decision is. Um, but I think we're going in the right direction and I think we have support from a lot of our officials and people that set policy that this is the right thing to do. Um, to move people, to give people the opportunity to live in the community. Who takes care of these people? In the community? From day to day, yeah. Direct care staff. And actually one of the things that uh, the council has done um, is supported a project through uh, the Bog Center, which is the university affiliated program for um, New Jersey, to uh, develop a training program for direct care staff. And so it's become very important for us, that are, those of us that are advocates, that there is a well-trained staff um, that will be um, the direct care for the people that are moving into the community. Uh, some of the people who are working in the institutions are also uh, participating in the College of Direct Supports, which is a program that's, that, that uh, they're being trained. Um, but we are very confident that for people who want to work in the field, if they go through this particular program, that they will have the skills to be good direct care staff. So you're talking about closing institutions down and moving into the localities where they'll be dealt with with home care professionals. Mm -hmm. why, why are you doing that? What are the advantages of that? Well, why not stay with a professional staff that for years has operated these institutional sites where there's a critical mass of professionals working there? Well, um, as, as I just mentioned, some of those people that are living in the institutions are actually taking this training. And it is anticipated that some of the people that work in the institutions will actually move into the community. Um, when we look at other states that have deinstitutionalized, um, we see that, that that is in fact is what has happened, is that people who have worked with the individuals in the institution have actually moved out into the community with with the people that they've been caring for 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 many years. So it's not that that we're cutting them off from one one um, particular caretaker uh, to put them with another or somebody that's less qualified. Um, we are anticipating that some will go with them and that people will be equally qualified. What doesn't work that you would want to make the change in the first place? 
why not leave the institutional system where it is? If it's working and it's been in place for decades, why do you want to change it? Well, it has been in, in place for decades, it's but that he, we believe that people belong in the community. Everybody belongs in the community. Um, I'm very, very familiar with institutions. I've worked in them. I've visited in them. And uh, it's an institution. We have a campaigner that the council called an institution is not a home. And it is not a home. It's an institution. And we really feel like everybody, whatever their disability is, what, whatever the level of their disability is, that they belong in a home in the community, to become part of their community, to get involved in community activities and um, truly be a neighbor, uh, rather than set off in a, a building that um, is, is frankly not homelike. And as much as they try to make some of the, the buildings home-like, and I've visited many of them, they're not. They're not a home, and we believe everybody has the, uh, the right to, um, to live in the community as, as the rest of us do. What about um, your own personal experiences dealing with a child mm -hmm. with disabilities? Now, how do you find, as the child gets older, you're able to kind of plan their future? Well, um, we don't plan my child's future. She plans it. Um, and we try to, to the extent possible, we try and support her in her decisions. She is living currently in a supported living situation. She has a roommate, she has an apartment. Um, and is doing very well in the community. What's and your disability also? She, she has a developmental disability, an intellectual know. disability, and she's doing very well. She's very much part of her community. Uh, she knows her neighbors. She rides her bike in the neighborhood. She eats at local restaurants. Um, she goes to parties. She goes um, over to Philadelphia to, to exhibits and... and um, around more than I do. Absolutely. She has a much more social life than I do. Um, what happens um, if you're, when you're out of the scene and she's forced to live by herself? Well, she probably will never be living by herself. She probably will always have a roommate and will always have somebody within the social service system who will be caring for her needs. Um, so it actually, uh, to my husband and I, it's a great peace of mind uh, to know that she is going to have that care for the rest of her life. But then she's living a life very similar to what she lived when she was living in our home, uh, where she was part of our community. Um, so she has just transferred that into a setting where um, she has people who are, who are caring for her um, on a 24-hour basis um, out of our home. Now, you've been doing this for almost 40 years. Mm. How has it changed? How has the disability advocacy world changed in four decades? When I first started doing this almost 40 years ago now, there was a very paternalistic attitude towards people with developmental disabilities. We had to look after them, and they were subjects, and uh, we, we were in control of their lives. And over the last 40 years, um, the whole philosophy and mindset about people with developmental disabilities has changed to where now they guide us as to how they want their life uh, to, to be led, how they want to lead their life. And so particularly we see this play out in, in the uh, Developmental Disability Council um, because the members of our council who have developmental disabilities and intellectual disabilities are just as much a part of our council as the parent members and the agency members. And 40 years ago, you would not have seen this. But over the years, there has been such a movement towards um, empowering people with developmental disability to speak for themselves. And as professionals for us to step back and allow them to do that. Um, we've seen great, great strides. We have a long way to go. And one of the things that we have to do is educate the community to also have the same kinds of 
of um, respect for people with developmental disabilities as we're learning to do um, as advocates. What's the next 40 years look like? Oh, I hope that in 40 years, a person... When you come back here in 40 in years. In 40 years, when I come back, and you I... you talk to us again, what? I hope that I can walk down the street and a person with developmental disabilities can walk towards me and it would be like just like anybody else walking towards me on the street. That there is no distinction, there is no discrimination, that there is no specialness for people with developmental disabilities, but they're just absolutely an integral part of our communities. How does the D Disabilities Act impact on what you're trying to do, the federal law that was passed under George Bush one? Um, you mean the ADA? No. Um, it has opened the eyes of a lot of people to realize that people with, with all types of disabilities are part of our community. It's, it has helped, um, I guess, uh, smooth out some of the, the obstacles towards full participation. For example, um, accessibility, accessibility into public buildings uh, has become really um, uh, something that people have, have, have gotten behind. Accessibility into restaurants, um, equal opportunity in the workplace. Uh, it has done a lot for leveling the playing field for, for people with disabilities. It was a great, great piece of legislation that took a long time to be passed. Um, there have been some assaults against it over the years uh, where they've tried to weaken some of, of the provisions, but um, we still see it as one of the landmarks piece of, landmark pieces of legislation for people with disabilities. If, in fact, I'm a part of this deinstitutionalization movement, I'm, a, I'm an individual who's being deinstitutionalized, and I find it doesn't work, is there recourse under the ADA for me to sue? And who would take my case? Um, I'm not sure that it would go to being sued. Um, there certainly is recourse. There are cases where people have moved into the community and it has not worked and so they have gone back into the institution. Um, and I'm sure that that will still be um, an option uh, for people that it just simply does not work for. Um, so I'm not sure that that would ever come to, come to that. Now you're talking really about uh, several states having done this already. Mm. What states are they? I'm just curious. Well, there are 11 states that have closed all of their institutions. Um, Vermont has closed all of theirs. Um, I believe New Hampshire is another one. New Mexico. Um, and off the top of my head, I can't name all 11 of them, but there are 11. Um, and there are other states who are down to one or two. Now, those are all poorer states. There are also more isolated populations. Are there any big states? New York, Ohio, Illinois, um, California? No. Um, I am not sure. Virginia has just closed one of theirs. I don't know whether it was the last one. Um, but there are some other larger states that, that have closed. I, I could certainly put, put those up on our website for people to well, look at. I was at. just curious if, in fact, that's a strategy for small, isolated, having lived in New Mexico, for strong, small, isolated, where there are communities. But what about an urban state like this, where I'm not sure I want to throw people back into some of our communities, considering the brutality that's going on in some in our major cities. What do you do in a situation like that? You know, you can never guarantee safety. You cannot guarantee it in an institution and you cannot guarantee it in a community. Um, we try to, as much as possible, make sure that the environment is safe, both in institutions and in the community. We do our very best to make sure that the situation is, is safe. And certainly when I looked at, at um, accommodations for, for my niece who I raised with, with an intellectual disability, uh, that's one of the things that we looked at. We looked at the neighborhood and we looked who would be caring for her. Safety is a big issue. Um, 
But to, to come back to whether or not it's, it's safe in, in an urban area rather than a rural area, um, the only other state that has more institutions than New Jersey is uh, Texas. And having lived in Texas, I know Texas is a very rural state. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure that, that it makes a difference whether it's rural or urban. Very good. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity to meet with you. We've talked about the changes that are taking place in the policies dealing with people with developmental uh, dis and physical disabilities. Allison Lozano, thank you very much, Doctor. We're honored that you came and we're moved by your, your articulateness and dedication. 40 years is a long time in a person's life. We thank you. And we hope that you'll join us again for our continuing discussion of public policy issues, especially that impact on the state of New Jersey. Thank you.